pleased to introduce uh, the Information Security Officer and a Professor in the Sociology and Computer Science Department at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, he's the author of two books on computer criminology and forensics due to uh, be published next fall. His name is Chad Johnson. Everybody, please give him a warm welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you all very much for joining me today. Uh, yes, I'm Chad Johnson. I am a professor of sociology and computer science at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about just a couple of the high-level theories that I discussed in some of my earlier courses. Uh, being a professor in both departments, uh, I do have an opportunity to uh, teach occasionally blended classes where half of my students will be sociology students and half of them will be computer science students. Uh, the theme of uh, lockdown 2019 is living in a cyber world and by any objective measure of a society we're definitely there and we have been for quite some time. So you might think that uh, a blended course wouldn't be that big of a deal for these students, but what I often find is uh, that my sociology students will react to technical topics with fear um, or they're intensely bored by technology, whereas my uh, computer science students may be skeptical of social science or intensely bored by that topic as well. Um, so I'm hoping uh, that uh, this is not going to be the case here. If, uh, if you're at this conference, presumably you've chosen a profession that fairly well blends the two, uh, but what you may not be cognizant of these theories and how they can be applied uh, to help you inform your security strategy and do appropriate risk-based analysis. Now, even though we are objectively living in a cyber world, that doesn't necessarily mean that all aspects of our society have caught up to that fact. And uh, one of the classic ways that we tend to lag behind, or one of the places we tend to lag behind, is in our, our justice system. Um, so one of the places where that is meted out, there we go, um, most starkly, um, to illustrate that point rather, is by introducing first the concept of a horse law. So a horse law is essentially extending old modalities to cover new legal situations for which we had no previous um, conceivable uh, way of identifying. So a good way to explain that, and this is certainly not a new thing, um, the internet, of course, changed everything, um, and we have a number of horse laws that extend over the internet, but it's a fairly old concept, and the name itself comes from earlier in our history when the primary means of conveyance for most people was the horse-drawn carriage. Of course, that being the case, there were a number of laws that were written in order to govern the use of horse-drawn conveyances, and one of those would be, for example, the necessity for every horse-drawn carriage to have a buggy whip holder in order to manage it, prevent it from falling and hitting the spokes or a bystander. Now, of course, then we had a technological advancement, and no longer was the horse-drawn carriage the primary means of conveyance. There was a transitionary period to the horseless carriage. However, the legal situation, uh, the legal system, rather, taking time to catch up to technological advances, still applied those old horse laws to the horseless carriage, and so despite the fact that there was no animal attached to it, it was still a requirement for some time in a lot of jurisdictions to have a buggy whip holder on your horseless carriage. Um, this happens even still today, and it's actually meted out in our nomenclature. We, of course, refer to data on a computer system as files, and there are many legal cases that identify a computer system for the purposes of the Fourth Amendment search and seizure cases to be considered either a closed container or a file cabinet. I don't have to tell anybody here that stretching that analogy doesn't go very far when you're talking about an actual computer system. We see the same thing with these theories. Crime, of course, has been around since uh, the beginning of our history, and there have been a number of theories that were developed prior to the advancement of our modern communication systems um, that, for one reason or another, we uh, have difficulty stretching uh, to cover these new situations. There are some, however, that aren't, that do apply very well, and there have been a number of them that have been advanced since then, which I'd like to talk about. I'm going to focus on four today. There are uh, dozens and dozens of criminological theories that could apply to these new situations, but uh, for the purposes of brevity, we'll focus on just the four. Uh, first, we'll talk about space transition theory, which is a behavior that explains the disparity between an individual's behavior online and offline. Routine activities theory, which uh, posits that you can prevent crime by identifying loci where they may be created, which applies very well to many online activities, many computer crimes. And next, broken windows theory, which explains how entropy can create disorder and lead to crime. 
and general strain theory, uh, which would be what, explaining what pushes somebody to engage in criminal coping or antisocial behavior. Uh, anyone here with a criminal justice background or works within the justice system, you probably have a, a good uh, reckoning of these uh, theories as they are now. I'm going to present them today in a reductive sense, just uh, in order to uh, create greater understanding. Just be aware of that, I guess, if you're familiar with them. So what makes implying theory difficult to crime when it's a uh, computer crime? Uh, well, there are four essential elements of modern technology and mass communication that tend to frustrate that process, tend to frustrate investigations, and to exacerbate the impact of crimes. And these four essential elements are essentially what makes it difficult for us to identify criminal uh, behavior uh, and to uh, identify behavior across, from, it bleeds from the real world into uh, the internet, for example. And those four are, first of all, anonymity. So there's, of course, a certain amount of identity flexibility on the internet. Of course, our keynote speaker uh, mentioned that it's become increasingly more difficult. Uh, anonymity has become more of a perceived anonymity than anything else. However, in terms of our identities online, we are still in a place where we can self-select our associations and our representation. Essentially, people know about us by what we put out there. Uh, this can be frustrating for an investigation, obviously. It can be difficult to identify individuals when they're, uh, they're obfuscating their, their personality and their identity. Uh, it can also be a boon, as we'll talk about in a moment, to certain computer criminals of certain types because it gives them a greater opportunity uh, to find victims and manipulate them. Uh, constant connectivity. There's nobody in this room right now that's probably more than five feet away from a computer that has access to the internet. Um, it's everywhere these days. All of us have a cell phone, a computer. Some of us have multiple such devices on us at any given time. Uh, that can be very frustrating when it comes to an investigation. It can also be a benefit because we are talking then about an abundance of potential evidence with all the devices that are out there. But it can be frustrating because then we reach a point where there is a volume of data to go through that's simply, it's just not practical to go through in the time period of an investigation. Uh, next is permanence, which is most troubling uh, when it comes to the exacerbation of the impact of a crime, particularly with child exploitation cases, where we'll see um, in modern exploitation cases where an individual doesn't just feel victimized by the event, but feels continually victimized knowing that their data is out there somewhere and someone is viewing it at any given moment. And finally, depersonalization, which goes hand in hand with anonymity. Uh, we uh, are able to choose our own identities online, but we also interact with people in a way where all we really have a sense of them by is their screen name, maybe a couple photos, and the text that they create. Um, there have been plenty of sociological and psychological studies that have shown that it is very easy to dehumanize people in this situation, making it much easier to disregard their feelings, to victimize them in the event of a crime. Essentially, they're never really quite real to us. So the first theory I'd like to talk about is space transition theory. Uh, essentially what this posits is that a person uh, with repressed criminal behavior may act differently um, when they're uh, able to insulate themselves from their actual identity. So essentially we have individuals uh, who maybe have a propensity for criminal behavior who don't act on that in the real world due to the social consequences. Uh, but when removed from those situations, uh, will act out on those impulses. Um, part of the explanation for this is that there is a, certainly a conflict of norms between what's acceptable in real-world interactions and what's acceptable online. Um, I mean, all you have to do is go on there for five minutes and uh, go ahead and put a post anywhere and guaranteed you'll be insulted by somebody within moments, right? That's the internet. Uh, whereas doing something like that in person would, would be unacceptable. Um, here the uh, concepts of identity flexibility and disassociative anonymity come into strong play. Uh, it's just that there's a lack of a deterrence factor. There are social consequences for your actions when your identity is associated with, uh, with, your, with your actions. Um, when that's not the case, when there are no consequences, uh, that's when people will act out. They have the opportunity to act out on those impulses. Uh, or essentially, you, you'll get a sense of a person's true personality when they are removed from all consequences for their behavior. This is particularly when we're talking about uh, malevolent personality traits uh, known as the dark tetrad, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but these dark tetrad traits can be suppressed in real life. So somebody who has a propensity for criminal behavior, uh, they don't act out on them in the real world because maybe they've been socialized to suppress those urges. So somebody who feels a callous disregard for other people's feelings 
through the process of their parents, their friends, and all that kind of thing, will we'll eventually want to suppress those because the social consequences are too great. Um, so let's talk about that dark tetrad. Now, a couple of the terms that you're going to see here are likely to be familiar with you uh, through pop culture. They may be familiar to you uh, as um, mental illness diagnoses, rather, of mental illness. I would like to point out before we start talking about these that the DSM has abandoned the use of terms like psychopathy and sociopathy. Um, right now, they are classified as cluster B personality disorders, and there are diagnostic criteria for them. This is not that. Uh, this is a sociological theory. So what we're talking about here when we're talking about the dark tetrad are um, essentially organizing different behaviors into different categories, behaviors of a similar stripe. Um, so when we talk about psychopathy, we may be talking about uh, the cluster B personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. They may share certain traits, but these are not diagnostic criteria. They're just ways of organizing, for lack of a better word, human cruelty, or evil, or what have you. Essentially, as sociologists, we would consider these predatory behaviors. So first we have psychopathy, which is a callous disregard for uh, other people, a sort of malevolent ins insensitivity. Um, we see this uh, a lot on online. Again, this the concept of depersonalization comes into play. People aren't quite real, and although somebody with these dark tetrad traits that may carry over into their real life, they can certainly express that online much easier because they are even less real to them. With narcissism, uh, again, not narcissistic personality disorder. We are talking about just the behavior of narcissism. Uh, social media, of course, we're not talking about mere vanity here. We do see plenty of that online. Social media provides an outlet for that kind of thing all the time. We see it everywhere. But what we're actually talking about here is a malevolent, a malignant narcissism. And social media provides those individuals with predatory be uh, narcissistic behaviors an opportunity to have unprecedented access to their victims. With Machiavellianism, we're talking about essentially a disregard uh, for other people for the advancement of their own agendas. Um, identity flexibility gives uh, uh, people with uh, dark tetrad traits and Machiavellianism uh, fantastic opportunities to victimize other people because it allows them to adopt many different personalities, many different personas, all at the same time, making it more easy for them to manipulate people. What we're talking about with Machiavellianism isn't necessarily a... Uh, uh, that they're very good at manipulating people. What we're talking about are individuals that uh, have certain markers when it comes to uh, pragmatism and manipulation, where they see it as a means to an end where it's acceptable. Uh, perhaps the most malevolent of the dark tetrad traits, especially when in conjunction with one of the others, is sadism. And this is expressed all the time online. What we're talking about here are individuals uh, who essentially get a rise out of hurting other people in some fashion. So somebody who happens to enjoy hurting people but also disregards their feelings or has narcissistic personality traits or Machiavellian personality traits, uh, certainly much more destructive than somebody who is not. Uh, most often online, this is expressed actually with, um, with the concept of what's known as casual sadism or everyday sadism, which explains things, for example, like internet trolls. So people who have sadistic personality traits in real life who suppress them uh, due to the social consequences, they feel frustrated by that. And so they're able to go, maybe they're frustrated at work, uh, they're unable to express those feelings, so they come home, they go on Xbox Live, play Call of Duty, and start hurling racial epithets at a 12-year-old. Everyday sadism. Um, the easiest way, I guess, to, uh, to identify the dark tetrad traits is to say that psychopathy is uh, people who would be willing to hurt other people because they simply don't register on their, uh, on their radar as having feelings as being other people. Narcissism, hurting other people, in order to reflect upon them, in order to gain some sort of intrinsically valuable um, reward. Machiavellianism, hurting other people in order to advance their own agenda, or sadism, hurting other people because they enjoy it. So how can we apply space transition theory in order to inform our, our risk, our, our security strategy? Well, most importantly is to keep in mind that a person's behavior offline doesn't necessarily equate to their online behavior. There have been plenty of instances where an individual um, seems to be very congenial and very, very nice in real life, but uh, then will turn around and their behavior online is a stark contrast to that. Um, the concept of uh, trust but verify comes to mind. Um, next, uh, in your environment, maintaining identity uh, or accountability rather is critical. Identity flexibility is one of the primary tools that people with predatory traits will take advantage of in the online space. 
So removing the most opportunities where accountability can be issued is, is critical. Uh, next, uh, and this is, speaks more to the future of the industry than anything else, is that it does appear to be possible to associate a person's behavior with some of these traits. Um, for example, you can use things like stylometry, behavioral attribution, uh, habit attribution, uh, behavioral analytics, which we will mostly know at this point in time, rather, being used for marketing purposes, can be used and can be leveraged to identify personality traits in individuals by their behavior. We see this in uh, Kotika Laputi, 2012, wherein there was a study of a, a college campus. Uh, students' net flow data was correlated with uh, self-submitted uh, personality uh, inventories and found that people who have depression tend to use technology differently than those who aren't, spending less time on a page, being more listless and uh, unpointed in their, in their surfing habits. Implications there being that it is maybe possible, rather, to use this to maybe reach out to individuals who are in need of assistance rather than having to ask them to seek it out themselves. We can also use this potentially in order to examine dark tetrad traits. There was Carpenter in 2016, which was able to identify dark tetrad traits in individuals based upon their Twitter usage and their submissions. So as far as the implications for the future of this industry, currently, of course, a lot of our uh, security systems rely upon signatures, uh, attacking from a technical perspective. But there may be a future coming where instead our intrusion detection systems are based upon detecting user intent 